Jungle Deep, 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 the podcast that explores the tropical lifestyle. Hello, and welcome to the podcast Jungle Deep. This is your host, Dr. Jones. We are on safari, and I'm here with you to learn, to have fun, and to explore the jungle. This is a particularly fun and funny episode today. We're going to get the inside scoop about what it was like to be a Hollywood Tarzan through our conversation with actor Denny Miller. Move over, Spock. Did you know that the elephants in the Tarzan movies were the first to wear ear appliances? Did you know that Tarzan used a ladder to get on top of his elephant? Did you consider that with the elephant's rough hide, there quickly develops a severe chafing problem when you're wearing only a loincloth? How about a loincloth made of seashells? Yes, Tarzan wore one, but it was scrap because it was too noisy. He simply could not sneak up on the bad guys. Is it true that Tarzan had to be constantly ready to punch his cute little co-star in the nose? What? Yes, hear all about this and more as we speak with successful character actor and Tarzan star, Denny Miller. Mr. Miller started his career starring in the 1959 release Tarzan the Ape Man. Mr. Miller has a roster of over 200 titles he appeared in during his career, spanning some 50 years. His shows included TV westerns like Laramie, Rifleman, and Wagon Train. He twice appeared on Gilligan's Island in spoofs of the Tarzan character from his earlier movie. Before Denny Miller was a movie star, he was a basketball star. He comes from a family of athletes. Today, he is still athletic and writes books about health and exercise. His latest book, just released, is called Me, Tarzan, You, Train. You can access photos and links to his books and movie career on the show notes page for this podcast at our Jungle Deep website. This is part one. Part two continues in episode 21. I'm really pleased to be able to share with our listeners today a conversation with Denny Miller. Denny Miller is a true-to-life Tarzan. And Denny, are you there? I'm here. Hello, Denny. I am so pleased to get to meet you and talk to you about your experience as Tarzan. You were in one of Hollywood's movies about Tarzan, uh, the one I believe uh, came out in 1959 called Tarzan the Ape Man. Is that right? That's right. It was a remake of an original that starred Johnny Weissmiller. And then it was 20 years later, it was done again by Bo Derrick. She didn't play Tarzan, but she played Jane. <laughs> so it's been made, remade. Two times. And you went on to an incredible acting career throughout the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. You've been in, in nearly 100 titles. And to look at the list of the shows you've been, I think I've seen you in, in at least half of those shows, especially the westerns. You got you had a real career in the 60s doing the westerns. You hit the uh, the Rifleman, uh, Laramie, Stagecoach, West. And, and of course, you're, you, you were, I think, most well known for your appearances on Wagon Train. You were on uh, numerous uh, episodes for Wagon Train. Uh-huh. Just an amazing career you've had uh, as an actor, and I appreciate you making time to talk to us today. We, of course, are focused on the jungle, on the tropical rainforest, anything and everything that has to do with the rainforest. And, of course, Tarzan is a major figure. He's probably the first and most famous character associated with the jungles. 
Tarzan was kind of important in your career to help get you going. I believe it's the first one you actually starred in. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And and it sure was fun riding in Nelson. <laughs> You must have done a few things. What was it like for you? I'm really curious because, I mean, I should tell our listeners that you have a background in physical fitness. Tell us a little bit about that and then how you got going in movies. You you were a basketball star at UCLA. Yeah, and they usually uh, got summer jobs for the um, athletes that were under scholarship, athletic scholarships. And uh, most of the time they were physical, and my summer job happened to be moving furniture for Beacon's Van and Storage, and I was pushing a chair down Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood when I heard some guy yell, Hey, you! And I answered to that. <laughs> Turned around, and there's a guy hanging out of his little old Carmen Ghia. You remember those kind of things. And um, <laughs> I walked and I said, who, me? And he said, yeah, come on over here and let me see your hairline. And I went, oh, my goodness. We got, <laughs> we got a strange one here. And I went over and pulled the hair back out of my eyes. And I said, how about that? And turned to go. And I heard over my shoulder, here's my card. Call me. And he gave me the card. And I was reading the card as I heard him drive off. Well, he was a, an agent, a talent agent. I took the card, put it in my pocket when I got home that day. After work, I, I threw the card in my sock drawer. And I got to work the next morning, and the dispatcher said, here's a phone number this guy called, wants you to call him. Doesn't know why you haven't called back. And that happened for four days. Finally, the dispatcher said, if you don't call this guy, you're fired. And that got my attention. And I called the guy. I told him, I'm not interested. Oh. He said, well, why did... <laughs> now, now, now did, he tell, did he tell you what he had in mind for you? Uh, he wanted to, to, to represent me. And so I, I okay. said, well, I've never done any of that, and uh, I'm going to be a basketball coach. And Anyway, he said, well, why don't you just come over to my office and we'll read a script together. And I said, oh, okay. And we did. And uh, At this point, you didn't know what it was for? No. I mean, he didn't have a specific project? No, in, no, uh, no, in no part in mind, just to represent uh, another okay. person in his flock of actors and actresses. I went over there and we read the script aloud. He played the the woman part. It was an old um, Gary Cooper film. I was leaving and he said, "Well, just uh, give me your phone number, your home phone number, and, uh, and I'll call you." He called the next week. I went on one interview over at Warner Brothers with a talent, a guy in charge of talent for the studio, and they asked me to go out in the hall and wait. And they came back out. The guy, his name was Robert Raison, and he says, they're going to test you. And I said, what's that? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, you know, this never came up in the, in the locker room uh -huh. in basketball. I, I never knew about this world. Anyway, I, I went and had a, a screen test. Now, it wasn't, I didn't have to memorize any lines. They wanted to ask you what your name was, how old you were, how your voice recorded, if you got frozen in front of a camera, that kind of stuff, real difficult. And they turned the camera on, and they said, let's see your right profile. And I turned, and they said, no, you're other right. <laughs> anyway, I was a little nervous. I managed to blurb out my name, my age, and uh, went home. And uh, about a week later, uh, the agent called and said, well, he offered you uh, to be a studio contract player, which was what most large studios had a, had a stable of actors and actresses in those days. And they would give them $150 to $180 a week and give them lessons and singing and fencing and acting and uh, diction and all that stuff. And in the meantime, they'd hire you out to other studios and charge the other studio more than you were making. I made less than the elephant in the Tarzan film and a whole bunch less than the chimpanzee. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I went there and I went to lessons for a year and a half and I got in a bit part with Buddy Epson in a television thing and I got a, 
another bit part with Sinatra and Dean Martin and Shirley MacLaine, the movie called Some Came Running, and most of my part ended up on the cutting room floor. But anyway, that's how I got into it, by accident. Now, my biggest problem was I was in a fraternity at UCLA, and a lot of my fraternity brothers were taking theater arts. And I had to explain to them why I had a seven-year contract with yearly options at MGM, it ended up, and they were still learning Shakespeare. I said, well, you can use my Beacon's van and storage uniform and stand on the corner of Sunset and Vine. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But nobody took me up on it. Your problem is you were just so good looking. Well, I don't know about that, but it was just so much fun. They they had to to spot you like that off the street. They had to like your look. I mean, you were you were a tall fellow, and and, uh, yeah, I was an an athlete. Yeah, you're you're very athletic looking and uh, great muscles and all. So I I I I just had a great deal of luck. My favorite actress, Catherine Hepburn, said that anybody that denies their career had involved uh, I'm sure a lot of true, practice. That's true, but now in tell denial, us about how said. you first heard about doing a Tarzan part. What did you did you were you familiar with Tarzan? Had you seen Tarzan yourself? As oh a, yeah, I'd read the books and uh, I'd seen a lot of Johnny Weissmiller's roles. Um, he made more than anybody. He made sixteen, I believe it was, of Tarzan films. And I hadn't met him, and I hadn't met Buster Crabbe. Mm-hmm. I did later on. Buster and I had the same interest he he was teaching uh people with arthritis how to exercise in a pool and help their range of motion and everything and that interested me mm-hmm. having a degree from ucla in physical education anyway you never really lost that interest in in physical education uh, no i did it's something you've no. been doing your whole life isn't it? It, it it has it has and my father before me he was on President Kennedy's and President Eisenhower's Council for Youth Fitness. He wrote a book called Fitness for Boys in 1943, mind you. Mm. Way ahead of his time, he designed obstacle mm. courses for the U.S. Army and mm. to get people in shape to go to war. My first job was with William Bendix in Life of Riley. Remember that old series? I, I do remember the name, yeah. Yeah, well, he had his daughter, his real daughter, playing his daughter on television. And I got my first role was a scene with William Bendix's daughter in the backyard on the set in a swing eating ice cream cones. And I said, my goodness sakes, I said it to myself, <laughs> of course, they pay you for this unbelievable and that was 55 years ago and i've been extremely lucky to have quite a variety of parts since yes well you certainly have you found me
na ungumu na undukupu anta milele ai na kwa kwa kweli ako You are listening to Jungle Deep. Deep. The beautiful Honolulu Zoo welcomes you in the spirit of aloha to come and explore their tropical paradise filled with exotic animals. Much more than a typical zoo experience, the Honolulu Zoo offers many specialized programs for the entire family. Look into their vacation adventures, Kiki's Night Out, stargazing at the zoo, twilight tours, and snooze in the zoo overnight adventures. All of this and more is available through the zoo's website. Visit HonoluluZoo.org for all the information. That's H-O-N-O-L-U-L-U-Z-O-O dot O-R-G. And when you visit, thank them for sponsoring the Jungle Deep Podcast. This is Kelly Camille Patterson of the Velveteen Lounge Kitchen, and I make my lime fellow marshmallow cottage cheese surprise while listening to Jungle Deep. Hi, I'm Al Bowl, film producer of Tarzan, Lord of Louisiana Jungle, and I clean my lenses while listening to Jungle Deep. Aloha, this is Marty Lush from the Tiki Aki Orchestra, and when I'm not vibing with the band, I'm listening to the vibes of Ken Jones and Jungle Deep. Jungle Deep, Deep, Deep. Hello, this is Dr. Jones. We don't just talk about tigers and toucans, elephants and orangutans on Jungle Deep. Because it is his 100 year centennial anniversary, we are also talking about the Lord of the Jungle, Tarzan. Authors, animators, actors, filmmakers, and even Tarzan himself are guests on our show. You have heard nothing like it. Listen to the podcast, Jungle Deep. Jungle Deep, Deep, Deep. deep. Hello, this is Dr. Jones. I believe the better you get to know the jungle's wonderful creatures, the more you will care about them. And as you care about them, you'll want to join with me in efforts to protect them and save them from extinction. I want to draw your attention to the Jungle Deep website and the ways I am promoting tropical rainforest education and conservation. In addition to the awesome expert guests and regular reports from our wonderful field correspondents on the podcast, I am building a website with resources to help everyone, especially students, find helpful and motivating information. One example is the new Wildlife Theater, which will contain a collection of photos and videos of exotic animals from the jungles around the world. Top-notch zoos and other conservation groups are contributing content to the Jungle Deep Wildlife Theater. You will find the Jungle Deep website by going to www.jungledeep.com. It couldn't be easier. Check the Jungle Deep website often because it is growing every week. Jungle Deep is a -a one-of-a-kind podcast that promotes conservation in a most entertaining way. If you want me to make more Jungle Deep episodes, let me know by making a donation to this environmental education podcast. If you would like, for a donation of $20 or more, I'll be happy to make a shout-out on the show. That's a short message. 
about your favorite wildlife or conservation organization. You may send any amount by check mailed to me, the producer, Ken Jones at P.O. Box 61, Murphy's, M-U-R-P-H-Y-S, California, 95247. You know, most people don't make a donation and just listen to the podcast for free. That makes your donation all the more important. The core message of Jungle Deep is that we need more people to participate in conservation. It's not enough to love nature. These days, caring about the environment absolutely requires action. Your action in support of this show will be used to grow Jungle Deep and to help me reach more people with our conservation message. Thank you. Now, more of Jungle Deep. Deep. Well, to go back to the, if we can go way back, I must. I guess it was in 1958 if the movie was released in 59. Can you remember how that came about and what you thought about being a Tarzan? Sure. Yeah. Did it appeal to you? Oh, yes, it did. But I, I, there were some guys there. I went to school with a guy by the name of Bill Smith, and he was under contract to MGM at the same time, and he was dark-haired and had a far better build than I did. We worked out at the same gym. And as a matter of fact, when they came to you as a contract player, they just, you go, they point and you go there and do the, whatever that work had to do. And they came to me one day and said, you're going to play Tarzan. But we're going to screen test you though first, which is a kind of an amusing story. I recommended Bill Smith. I said, my gosh, he's under contract to you guys. And they said, no, no, we're going to screen test you in some outfits. They had one made of shells and everything. And when you walked, you made too much noise. You couldn't sneak up on anybody. And the screen test amounted to, unbelievably, for me and anybody I tell, I come out of the jungle soaking wet, and Jane, who the Joanna Barnes, who eventually ended up playing Jane, she was testing at the same time. And I sit down on a log and recite the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> now, they said after I did it, they said, that's fine. And they tested some a few other guys. 
And they said, we're going to make Tarzan a very intelligent fellow. <laughs> and that's why you recited the 23rd Psalm. Well, hmm. <laughs> the 23rd Psalm had 10 times as many words as I ended up saying in the whole film. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they were re they they were really reaching for some new new, new angles on this Tarzan thing. Weren't they wear, though? Wear, wear, wear a loincloth made out of shells and having you recite yeah. the toilet. Yeah, they opted <laughs> for the old chamois skin one, and we yeah. did we did use an old cement stream that they had on the back lot, which is now condominiums down in Cove City at MGM. And Johnny had made most of his films right there in the back lot, and they made. They were so money-making films that they kept going. I only made one, but he made 16. Uh, Gordon Scott made, I think, five. And Lex Barker made. It, there have been 22 guys play the role. I was number 12. Oh, so you know your number, number 12. You huh? bet. Right and I was, I was in the talkies. <laughs> the first guy was a guy by the name of Elmo Lincoln. And he right. made two. He was in the silent days. Strangely, I'm from Bloomington, Indiana, and they call Indiana people Hoosiers. Nobody knows what that means, especially in Indiana, but anyway, they call them that. And the three guys that have played Tarzan have come from Indiana. Elmo Lincoln, the first one, myself, and a guy by the name of James Pierce, who was a big football player from Oregon University. And he married Edgar Rice Burroughs' daughter. Now, that helped him a little bit, I think. And he and his wife played Tarzan and Jane on the radio, and then he did several Tarzan films as Tarzan. Hmm. Supposedly, I've never been there, but the little town in, called Shelbyville, Indiana, which is just near Indianapolis, James Pierce and his wife supposedly are buried in a cemetery just outside Shelbyville, Indiana, and on his tombstone is Tarzan and hers is Jane. It's, I've never been there, and I, but I've heard that from several people that should know. But anyway, it's been it's been a kick. I couldn't get come close to the yell. I sounded like a wounded yak, whatever that sounds like. So, so you did try to mimic. Oh, that, yeah. they made me do it all, all through the film, and then they just snipped it out and put one that Johnny Weissmiller uh -huh. and some instruments did. The one you hear, the one that uh, the famous one, yeah, yeah. Nobody can do it except Johnny came closest because he could yodel and he could hit the high notes. But mine was a sad thing. I, I went to visit and give a talk at the. Uh, Brigham Young University to the theater arts people up there. And for entertainment, they took me to hear the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, a rehearsal. And the church was full. They're so popular. This I don't know, they have four or 500 people in the choir. And we're sitting there, and they sing, and then the director t turns around and says, I understand there's a Tarzan in the and he asked me to stand up, and that, that happens everywhere I go. <laughs> Give us the L. I finally figured out I can't do it, and then fit in doing this yell for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. I said, mm -hmm. I am right. calling you. <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> Nelson Eddy used to sing that in some film. <laughs> Got a good laugh. <laughs> so. <laughs> So you, you, yeah, it's inevitable if you're, you're Tarzan. I guess everywhere you go, people are gonna if they introduce you, they're gonna want to hear you the Tarzan oh. yell. And if, if you can't do it, you, you're substituting. You're doing some singing for him. Instead. That's right. That's right. And well, that's probably a, a smart choice. Oh, it's better. I used to get involved with little kids, and I'd say, well, if I, if I gave the yell, every animal in two miles around us would show up here, and it would be a mess. And they would never believe me. So, Denny, when you're on the set and you're, you're having to do this yelling and you know you really can't do a decent job of it, did, did you find it embarrassing to to, yeah. to, to to try? Was that an embarrassing yeah. thing for you? Oh, yeah, because it was just so horrible. <laughs> well, now tell us, it, tell us about the animals. Did you have any qualms of working with some of these exotic animals? No, I didn't. The elephant, I, I can recommend people. Uh, it's a fun ride uh, if you have a ladder to get up there. 
and <laughs> don't go up there with shorts because now wait now wait a minute, Denny. I'm sure Tarzan did not use a ladder. To oh, get on I own. did. <laughs> <laughs> At least in one shot, they I just got back and took a leap, and the, they had the elephant laying down. Their hair is like SOS pads. Right. Yeah, it's very coarse. And yeah. when they stop walking, they don't stop moving. They just rock back and forth. So you're sitting up there in this SOS pad with shorts on, and just not the right thing to do. So I, I had luckily, you know, did you know that they use Indian elephants instead of African elephants because they can't train African elephants, and they put phony big ears. Oh, do they? Over. Oh, yeah. They did that for, and, for your movie? Yeah. <laughs> and I was so pleased because there was a big band of rubber that held the two ears up there. I have something to hold on to. They could make you some kind of little discreet saddle that would help protect your legs from that, that abrasion. Sure. <laughs> Not so. They would get too close oh, for that. So yeah, now that's run. a downside I hadn't thought about. Yeah, that would be a downside, yes. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I mean, those yeah. loincloths don't offer a lot of protection, you know. <laughs> yeah, not not too much protection from the loincloth. I'm, I'm looking at it. I They used two in case I got wet, which I did uh, quite a few times. But I have one of them here framed in my office. Oh, do you? And... Uh, yeah, but what are you going to do with it? <laughs> no, there's not too many occasions for wearing that anymore. No. <laughs> no, thank goodness. Anyway, uh, the chimp trainer. Yeah. The chimp trainer told me before we shot one foot of film, if he bites you, punch him because he's going to take part of you with him if you don't. Evidence of that, a friend of mine who was a linebacker for the Los Angeles Rams football team, Mike Henry, was doing a film, a Tarzan film in uh, Brazil, holding the chimp that he'd been working with for four or five weeks, just like a baby. And the chimp leaned over, facing Mike, and 72 stitches later, they sewed Mike's chin back on. Oh, oh dear. Oh. When I was working, it wasn't near as bad because the guy had warned me. And so I, at one point, I was walking through the jungle with my, I had my hand on his, the chimp's hand. And I felt this rather dull pain and he was biting into the meaty part of my left hand. And I came, I pulled it up and he was still hanging there and I punched him in the nose. And he went up in the rafters, and it took us a half an hour again to get him back down. Oh, dear. But I'm glad I had been told to punch him. Hmm. He didn't even break his skin. But So um, things aren't quite as cute on the set as they appear on the film sometimes. No, no, they never are when you're working for, uh, with animals. Wagon train, uh, horse ran off with me, but I had two stunt guys on a horseback on either side, and they turned the horse before I was strained through a chain link fence. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh dear. Over in Universal when they were doing wagon training. This concludes part one of our conversation with Denny Miller. Our next episode, number 21, offers the second half of our remarkable visit with Denny. The music in this podcast has been, in the intro, Jericonda Mix by Ken Jones with Apple Loops, Excerpts from the wonderful album African Dawn, Voice of Celebration, Papa Duniani, and Johannesburg Promise. And the segment in our episode closing is by Don Tiki called Jungle Julie. Be sure to share Jungle Deep Podcast with your friends and co workers. This show is my creation and at my personal expense. It is not currently subsidized by any business or organization. Audience growth is especially important for Jungle Deep to succeed and prosper. So share the show. You can see beautiful photos and learn more about Jungle Deep at our website, jungledeep.com. You gotta check it out. Where else can you go for this kind of fun? Our show notes pages have valuable links for you. I invite you to email me at ken at jungledeep.com or follow me on Twitter. Search for Jungle Deep or Ken Jones 56, all one word. I would love to hear your ideas for the show. Well, the show's over for today, so it's time to refill my Mai Tai 
mount my elephant, and head back into the jungle.